Remember the uh, uh, slide that you saw about the survey, um, in that health applications are, are, are not used as much as, say, Candy Crush. Um, we really have a lot of uh, pioneers here, Dr. Lester, Dr. Holmes, designing apps that are fun to use. Because ultimately, the iPhone or the Android, uh, the Android and the iPhone, um, are really looked at as fun devices, right? These are devices that people love to Almost to the point where, I don't know if you've gone out to dinner and you've seen like four people in the, their 20s, early 30s, just talk, you know, on their phones, not talking to each other. Um, that's what restaurants will look like in the future, probably. Um, but people really enjoy what they're doing with their phones. So by developing applications for health that are fun to use, um, I think is really going to drive those numbers up that we saw. Because um, typically, when you, you know, Google health topics on the web, they're not the most interesting or, or fun to read. So for our final speaker today, we're really honored to have Dr. Bob Wachter. And Dr. Wachter is a professor and interim chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. He also directs the Division of Hospital Medicine, and he's the author of over 250 articles and six books, and coined the term hospitalist. And in 1990, he did that in 1996 and is generally considered the father of hospitalist medicine. I'm a hospitalist, so I guess technically you're my father. <laughs> so I need 20 bucks. Um, we'll, we'll talk later. He's also the past president of the Society of Hospital Medicine and past chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine. In 2004, he received the John and Eisenberg Award, the nation's top honor in patient safety. And in uh, 2015, he received the Modern Healthcare uh, Magazine Most Influential Physician Executive in the United States. And that's his eighth consecutive year of being in the top 50. His 2015 book, The Digital Doctor, uh, Hope, Hype, and Harm at the Dawn of Medicine's Computer Age, uh, was a New York Times bestseller in, in science. So uh, please welcome Dr. Wachter. Notice he has not given it back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, what's remarkable is my actual son is in the audience somewhere. Doug, where are you? There he is, all the way, all the way in the back. So, <laughs> I, the, the fact that I gave you 20, Mike, is going to cost me a little bit more. <laughs> so, uh, my son just moved to LA a few months ago, and uh, I'm thrilled that uh, he and his girlfriend are, are with us today. Uh, just this isn't the school of anything can happen if you live long enough. Uh, we grew up in San Francisco, obviously, and Doug was a massive San Francisco Giants fan. His first email address was uh, bla at aol.com. <laughs> and when he told me he's a baseball analytics guy, and so when he told me he got a job for the Dodgers, I said, if you live long enough, you will see everything. But uh, <laughs> I am officially rooting for the Dodgers. Um, my job here is to be the sunk in the room. And uh, first of all, I have to say is that. Uh, I go to a lot of conferences. Uh, congratulations to students. This is the best organized conference I think I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, they've done a beautiful job putting together. And I've been tremendously inspired by the talks that I have heard already and doing remarkable things here. We're doing some of the same, although I've learned a lot from what I've heard. Uh, but uh, my job is to, uh, to uh, bring this down a little bit and talk a little bit about reality and where we are and some of the steps that we may need to go through to get to this magical place that we all want to get to. So that's what I'm going to try to do uh, with you uh, this morning. Uh, let me tell you why I decided to get into health IT. I'm not an IT uh, person per se, uh, although I blog and I tweet and I have, sorry, an iPhone and, and uh, you know, I obviously am pretty digital as things go, uh, but was never an informatics person. But uh, really spent the last couple of years thinking a lot about informatics. I'll tell you why. Uh, First of all, I have my phone, and it's obviously transformed my life as the way it's transformed all of our lives, and that's sort of clear to all of us. Second reason is I've spent the last 10 or 15 years thinking about patient safety and medical mistakes. 
And if you've been in the world of patient safety, we all have been sitting there waiting for computers to solve all the problems. I can't tell you the number of root cause analyses I've been at in the last 15 years where the issue was, oh my God, if we just had computers, this wouldn't have happened. Here is a classic example. Anybody know what this is a prescription for? Movement, of course, except it's not it for Avandia. <laughs> and, uh, and this and, and this mistake actually killed the patient. So uh, there have been uh, there have been thousands and thousands of errors because people have tried to decipher doctor's handwriting or didn't have the decision support that would have told them the patient was allergic to a medicine they were about to get. Uh, and you, you've all seen that. So if you've been working in the field of patient safety, you could not help but wait for this moment when we finally uh, would go digital. Uh, the thing that really got me interested in this was an error that we committed at UCSF a couple of years ago where a 16-year-old kid was supposed to get a, one SEPTRA twice a day in our hospital, fantastic hospital, uh, has the same uh, ethics system that you have, so electronic like health record, barcoding, all that good stuff. Supposed to get one double spring SEPTRA a day, one of the 12 medicines he was on, uh, but instead, through a series of errors, that had a lot to do with the interface between people and computers. We ended up giving him 39 Scepter tablets. That's what 39 Scepter tablets, barcoded, shrink wrap, uh, looks like before. And there's four of those packets open and had this kid take 39 pills in one, uh, in one uh, shot. Uh, just because of dumb luck and Scepter is not that toxic. He had a grand mal seizure but did not die. So just very, very lucky. And I suspect he will never, ever have a urinary tract infection for the rest of his life. <laughs> uh, but I sat there listening to this case in a very good hospital with wonderful people and completely wired. And we're, here we are giving a kid 39 pills in a way that we could not have done on paper. And I said, wow, this is harder and more complicated than it looks. And the things I was reading about health IT were exuberant and a little bit hypey. And I said, somebody needs to think about this and write about this. Uh, and so that's what I spent the last couple of years uh, thinking about and, uh, and I wrote a book that came out about <coughs> months ago. So let me tell you in my journey, one of the things that happened when I decided to write the book, I came home and I said to my wife, I want to write about the digital, the digital transformation of medicine. And my wife is a journalist, she writes the New York Times. And, uh, I, and she said, well, you're going to have to do this journalistically. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, you're going to have to go out and talk to people. I said, I hate people. <laughs> I said, I know that, but it's the only way you're going to get it right. So I spent about eight or ten months running around the country talking to everybody I could think of talking to, the, the leaders of Epic and Nathina and other health IT companies, the directors of the federal office in charge of health IT, <coughs> frontline docs, nurses, digital patients, uh, everybody I could think of, and really, I think, came to understand the nature of the problem, and that's what I want to talk to you about spend a few minutes talking about the big picture and then I'll drill very quickly into what we're talking about today, which is sort of patient-centered IT and apps and things like that. So here's some of the lessons that I learned along the way. Uh, this is Rich Barron, who is, I was about to say Clarence's boss, but Clarence is actually his boss, as it turns out. He's the CEO of the American Board of Internal Medicine, as you probably know Clarence Braddock, the chair of the ABIM, uh, a, a, a thankless and very hard job these days, but he's doing a spectacular job. Uh, Rich, prior to becoming the head of the ABIM, uh, was a primary care doc in Philadelphia in a four-person practice. And Rich is a really smart, savvy guy who decided to digitize his office well before it became fashionable uh, about 10 years ago. He put in the best ambulatory IT system he could find. They thought about the workflows and all that kind of good stuff, and then, then they, and they did the teaching and they put it in, and Rich said to me, the staff came to work one day and nobody knew how to do their job. I think a really profound comment that, that the system was good, they trained, but the nature of the work had completely changed when they went from analog to digital. And I asked Rich what the biggest issue was, he said, post-it notes. He said, our work, the backbone of our workflow was post-it notes, and now we didn't know what to do with the data that used to be on post-it notes. And I said, you know, couldn't you, in retrospect, couldn't you have anticipated that and thought about your workflow? He said, we tried. He said, but you cannot understand what your life digital is going to be like until you are digital. This turns out to be a generic problem in technology. Uh, Henry Ford was reputed to have said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. 
Nobody had any idea what their life with cars would be until there were cars. And I think this is part of the challenge that we're facing now as we go digital. Source sounds good, we map it out, it looks good, but then it changed the nature of all of the work the relationships. And I think that's really hard, and we're just kind of beginning to scratch the surface. Here's another thing we got wrong. Uh, this is Secretary of Health Mike Levitt during the, in, in the Bush administration. And then the kind of run up to the Bush administration made a big investment in health IT. Uh, this was designed to be inspiring, and it is. He said, we have the capacity to transform health with one thunderous click of a mouse after another. Who could not be inspired by that? <laughs> Nine years later, a study came out, or eight years later, a study came out and said, ER physicians spend 44% of their time entering data into EMRs, thunderously clicking up to 4,000 times during a 10-hour shift. Nobody anticipated that, but that is the nature of our work now. We're spending a huge amount of time feeding this baby clicking away, going out to check boxes, uh, because the system's now demanded. And I'm gonna show you a quick video that makes this point, I think, quite nicely. Honey, look. He's playing doctor. <laughs> That's doctor, all right. Come to this. This is the nobody anticipated the idea that EMRs and health IT would actually be a major dissatisfier for clinicians, but survey after survey says that today they are. Uh, and this is where I knew things were completely off the rails. I found this ad from last year uh, from uh, Arizona General Hospital. Starts out innocently enough. It's a, a coming to Grand Canyon State, it's located in a suburb of Phoenix. It's a 40,000 square foot boutique. General Hospital. Who would not want to work in a boutique General Hospital? It's <laughs> great. So what do they got? It's an ad. So remember, they're looking for an ER doc. Uh, they have an ER, which is nice. <laughs> they have that. They have a radiology suite, the latest toys, two state-of-the-art ORs, small uh, outpatient surgery, small hospital, 16 inpatient rooms. The only part of the ad that was in bold, clearly they thought was their main selling point, was they have no electronic <laughs> medical. <laughs> So in 2014, a modern hospital thought the main way of advertising a doctor would be to say that you could use pen and paper and clipboards and three-ring binders. It's really quite striking and says something about how hard this is. So what is the nature of the problem here? I came to believe that uh, this is uh, uh, Ron Heifetz from the Kennedy School of Government talks about technical versus adaptive change. Technical change is straightforward. You follow a checklist or a cookbook, it's all good, and I think we came to believe that health IT was technical change because my iPhone is technical change. When was the last time you read the instructions after you downloaded an app? When was the last time you didn't do anything other than click I accept and just go on and start using it? It's so si simple that we believe that health IT was like that, and it's the mother of all adaptive changes. As Heifetz says, adaptive changes are just the opposite. So these are problems that require people themselves to change, an adaptive problem, the people are the problem, and the people are the solution, and leadership is about mobilizing, engaging them with the problem, rather than trying to anesthetize them so you can go off and solve it on your own. So that's the nature of the problem here. How do we build these tools, these apps, these sensors, all this sort of good stuff, but not believe naively that it is technical change? And I heard some of that in the last talk, this, this notion that, yeah, we can build it, but we really have to study it to figure out if it works. The Fitbit, what a fantastic, spectacular idea. Uh, I bought mine, it is sitting somewhere in my closet, and I expect I will find it again under a closed pile the next time I move. Uh, but it's a great idea. So uh, it's really, we have to deeply understand how people interact with these tools if we're going to get it right. Certainly in the world of electronic health records, despite very smart people like Mike and others working on it, I don't think we have quite gotten there. Uh, one more word, uh, a little bit about uh, the book business, which also has gone digital, of course. Uh, so my book came out about eight months ago. One of the things that happens today is when your book comes out, you're obviously listed on Amazon, and you have the sales ranking. 
and the lowest book on Amazon sales writing is number eight million when you launch, which is incredibly disheartening. <laughs> and you try to kind of claw your way up the list, the best-selling book in the in, in the, the world is number one. Uh, Amazon changes their sales ranking every hour. Uh, any author who does not confess that he or she is, is refreshing their screen every hour for the first month is lying to you. I'll tell you that. So this happened to me about a month after my book came out. I went to type the digital doctor name of the book to see how I was doing. And uh, luckily, I was the best-selling book with that search term, but the second best-selling book was Dr. Roman Medical <laughs> Hospital. <laughs> billionaire Dr. Roman Medical Hospital, bachelor short story. Uh, as you see, uh, his customer ratings are as good as mine. <laughs> and what was really upsetting was when I figured out that this book is free. <laughs> All right, so let me, I want to contextualize this issue of digitization of healthcare and kind of what it means. This is now big picture, 35,000 feet. I was talking to the medical students at UCSF uh, a couple of, uh, about a year or two ago, and they're incredibly smart and committed, like, like yours. They're wonderful. They get it. Uh, I don't know why I wanted to shake them up. And I said to this group of students, you are entering a profession completely different than the one I entered 30 years ago because you will be under relentless, unremitting pressure to figure out how to deliver high-quality, safe, satisfying care at the lowest possible cost. There's no true value. I really wanted to kind of shake them up. And they thought about when students raised his hand and he said, what exactly were you trying to do? <laughs> I thought it was the most profound question I ever heard because we all are reeling from these changes and these new pressures and value and quality and safety and all that, uh, what is odd is not that we're having to deal with it. What's odd is that it's new. What's odd is that the old pressure had nothing to do with that. It was all about filling the building and seeing more patients. That was crazy. What we're dealing with now is perfectly reasonable, although quite difficult. Here's the second thing that's happened, which is that we have finally become a digital industry, partly with federal incentives, uh, as the wind behind our backs. This is in, as you probably know, in 2010, the federal government began doling out $30 billion of incentive payments to doctors and hospitals to prompt us to buy electronic health records. Amazing that they had to do that. Think about how ridiculous it would be if the federal government was putting out incentives to, for the manufacturing industry to computerize or, or the, uh, the, the journalism industry to computerize. Those happened naturally and organically. It was not happening in medicine. So the Fed stepped in, started giving out money, and it has worked. And so it really is not hyperbolic to say in the last five years we've gone from primarily an analog business to primarily a digital business. It is a very, very big deal. To me, this is the way I think about the two transformational trends that we're living through in medicine. The first is the pressure to deliver high value care. Absolutely big, big, big deal, a big change. The second is that we become a digital industry. If you ask me, ask me today in my day job running a division, running a department now, uh, what I think about, this is the dominant issue. When I come in the morning, as in the part of my life I'm thinking about clinical care, the big deal is how do we deliver care that's better, safer, more satisfying, better access, and cheaper. That's the dominant issue. I'm guessing if you asked me 10 years ago, I will say that this was the bigger deal. It's not yet, because I think we're just scratching the surface uh, in it. But it will be the bigger deal that we've gone from analog to digital. Why do I say that? Because I think we know how to do this. Not that we are great at it yet, but I think we know how to do it. I don't think it violates our paradigm. I think you know we have an org chart, and on our org chart now, there's a chief quality officer. And now uh, there are people in our practices who understand digital medicine that are trying to use new tools to get us to improve satisfaction or access uh, or, or cost. But it doesn't violate the fundamental ways we think about our work. Uh, unless healthcare completely violates what we've learned about every other industry that has digitized, uh, this will completely violate the way we've thought about our work. And our, our, our natural sweet spot and comfort zone about this is how we organize ourselves, it's created incentives, think about our practice, how we train students, all that. Uh, we will come to believe that it's all wrong that we have to rethink everything because that's what's happened in every other industry. 
How do we know that? Ask a friendly cab driver uh, about how he or she feels about Uber. Ask your hotel director how they feel about Airbnb. Ask my wife. Uh, the New York Times was an organization like UCLA and UCSF that said, we are the New York Times. You know, we're, we can't be threatened. The New York Times, if they had not completely rethought their digital strategy five years uh, ago, they'd probably be out of business. The LA Times is not out of business, but it's reeling because they have been turned upside down by digitization. So I think this will turn out to be the bigger deal. Not quite yet, but if you're thinking about where the puck is going, that's where it's gone. Where are things, what are things going to really be interesting? The metaphor I kind of like here is that of the transcontinental railroad. If you think about it, you have these two sets of tracks being built from two coasts. And this is the way I think about it. Uh, and one set of tracks for digital healthcare is traditional enterprise electronic health record. And we're now, as I said, pretty far along with that. We all have that Cerner, you name it. We have an enterprise system in the doctor's office and in the hospital. It's a big deal. That's one set of tracks. Here's another set of tracks that is being built out quite rapidly, as you heard from the meeting in Las Vegas uh, this week. You know, huge numbers of companies jumping in app sensors and all that. Uh, enormous work being done in this area. You've heard some really wonderful examples of that during this conference. <coughs> right now, those tracks do not connect with each other. And even this you know, spectacular tool being built for, uh, for inflammatory bowel disease patients. Right now, does not connect, and you can see. Oh, it should be easy to connect it. But that slide demonstrate how unbelievably hard it is to get all these pieces to link up. When that happens, when somebody lays the golden spike, and there is digital data about every patient forcing through the system seamlessly, that's when things will really take off. That's when you start seeing massive disruption, massive transformation. And I think for places like UCLA and UCSF, we have to be at the forefront of that, or else we're probably dead. And I think that's why it's so exciting to see the kind of work that we're doing. That's basically, that's sort of my intro. This is that's the big picture as I see it in the world of digitization. Now let me sort of peel, uh, to turn over to really focus on the topics that we've been talking about here today, which is patient-facing uh, sensors, apps, uh, mobile. And let me say one more thing. The $30 billion that got healthcare to finally computerize uh, how much of that money went to the Silicon Valley app developers and the venture capitalists who invest in health IT? Anybody know? The answer is zero. There was no, none of the investment went there. It was all to hospitals and doctors to buy enterprise electronic health records. And yet, the, as the money began flowing, the amount of investment in Silicon Valley in apps and sensors went through the roof. And why was that? Because the Googles, the Apples, and others of the world knew that they needed to be in healthcare but have tried over the years and always failed. And part of that was because they were developing things, but there was nothing to connect to. I think what happened was these companies recognized that here is 18% of the gross domestic product, the only major swath of the American economy that is not digital, and now it's going digital, we better jump in. So that is what's happened in Silicon Valley, and obviously it's happening down here as well. That's why this is a particularly interesting moment, not just because of enterprise and EHRs, but also the apps and sensor world. Okay, so here's what we're talking about, all this kind of good stuff. So let me take you through some of my basic thoughts about this. This is where uh, I become the skunk in the room. All right, uh, this was a pretty easy prediction. It will grow. Someone will make a lot of money on it. <laughs> it will be massively overhyped. Partly because those companies trying to make a lot of money on it will try to make you believe that their product will be the one that will completely transform healthcare and make uh, diseases go away and bring costs down to nothing. There will be enormous garbage in, garbage out problems. Digitizing garbage is, does not make it anything other than digitized garbage. And if you look at even the enterprise electronic health records now and trying to make sense of what's going on in a patient's life from reading the notes, you realize there's a massive amount of garbage and a fair amount of fiction in there as people have checked a whole bunch of boxes about an exam that they probably did not do. Uh, digital flow of useless data is still useless. We will pay insufficient attention to workflow and adaptive change issues. Patients acting as their own doctors will over and under diagnose themselves. And I'm glad it's happening, since the sooner we start, the sooner we'll work it all out. So that's my bottom line. This is not meant to say we shouldn't be doing the things that we're doing, or, or that I'm not unbelievably excited from the 
about the kinds of things I've heard, because eventually this is going to be really quite wonderful, and we have to work through all these stages, and I think you've heard some examples of very thoughtful people doing just that. So here's the promise. The promise is that the use of big data for precision medicine, so drilling down to what an individual patient needs based on features of them that we could either not know in the past or not analyze in the past, will be will have massive promise. In addition, our ability to figure out how to organize healthcare delivery in different ways using the same kind of thinking and, and data is a tremendous. Uh, health IT also will be a tremendous enabler of transparency, and I'll talk about that in a second. And I'm finally going to talk a little bit about new tools for patient engagements and how to promote behavioral change. You've heard a little bit about it, so I'll give you my own spin. So let's take a start with the big data. You've heard a little bit about that. I'll, I'll give you kind of my own take on it. So it's not a large leap for uh, Netflix to know that customers like me who like these things I'm watching also like or Amazon saying customers like you who bought these books also like these books. It's not a large leap from doing that to patients like yours turned out to have lupus. So you're making, looks like you're about to make the wrong diagnosis, doctor. Or patients like yours did better on ceftriaxone than Levo or better on Remicade than, uh, than uh, Mesalamine. Or, this is, could be troubling for any of us, Patients like this did better when they went to a different hospital than your hospital. <laughs> you hope it said patients like this do better if they go to your hospital, but that this, this is this is the future of taking data and using it in new ways, ways that we have not used before. Let's talk a little bit about transparency. So one of the things that has been a, a, a remarkable attribute of healthcare is, is the astounding lack of transparency how little information patients have that would allow them to make informed choices. You try to figure out uh, who is the best doctor to see for my inflammatory bowel disease or my, uh, or my depression uh, uh, or which hospital to go to. Uh, it's much easier to figure out what car I should buy, what refrigerator I should buy, what toaster oven I should buy. I get calls all the time. I call myself my, my uh, these days I'm a witch doctor. I tell people which doctor they should see. <laughs> I get calls all the time, you know, my Aunt Minnie in Philadelphia needs to see an ENT doctor. Now, I am the most insider insider. What do I do? I go onto the web, I look up ENT doctors in Philadelphia, I look at where they went to med school, I look at, oh, she looks like a nice person, I'm looking at Google Images. I, I, I am doing as an insider, it's a joke, and finally I realize, oh, my old med school roommate lives in Philadelphia, I'll just call him, that's the only the fact that there is really no legitimized source of data to allow patients to make decisions is extraordinary and is going to change very quickly because part of the reason for that was when all the data about people was on paper, you had no way of taking it and making it public and analyzing in ways that were useful for people. So there's always, in every industry, there's always going to be a tug of war between the insiders who say, we can't really release this data out to the public because they won't understand or it, will, it won't be quite right. Once you digitize the data, now it's going to get out. You can assume it will be out. And so Health IT, I think, transforms this tug of war. And all of the pressures that often come from the profession to say, not, don't let the data out, those are going to be overwhelmed by the ease with which digital data will get out there. We have to get used to it, and we have to figure out how to not only look good, but be good so that as people look online to figure out how good we are, uh, they decide to come to us. We'll talk for a moment about the internet as a diagnostic tool. This is an area that's exciting, but a little bit scary. And you see here data from Pew, Pew study, 59% of adults have looked up information in the last year. 35% say they've used the internet to try to figure out what diagnosis they have. 53% of these online diagnosticians also talked to a clinician. 41% uh, of them had their uh, condition confirmed by a clinician. Patients are, whether we like it or not, patients are online trying to figure out what's going on. It's also patients have new and uh, growing access to their own information. As you probably know, uh, it was actually an HIPAA law. Patients had a right to see their medical record for 20 years. But try getting your medical record from a paper hospital. You have to figure out where the medical records department is. You can see the grumpy clerk there. Uh, he says, oh, sure, we can get you your record. It'll take us three weeks to photocopy, and then it costs $1.50 a page, or your record is 1,300 pages long. Well, I didn't really need my record that much. 
now that all now all that separates a patient from her medical record is a password. And what you see is this trend, and Mike tells me you're already doing this, uh, toward open notes, the idea that patients can see everything, not just their lab, de lab data uh, and x-rays and make appointments online and email their doctors, but actually can read their doctor's notes. The pioneer here has been Tom DeBanco, with that Israel Deaconess, and the studies they have done, even though people were quite scared about this, the studies that they have done have shown that by and large it works out okay, patients like it, and it does not ruin doctors' lives, although you've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, we can't uh, write anymore that the patient is SOB, uh, meaning short of breath, because patients see that and they kind of interpret it the wrong way. <laughs> and uh, open notes are now available to about 5 million patients in the United States. As I understand, in many of or most of your clinics here, we have not yet turned this on. Epic, you can easily turn it on. And there's just been a $10 million grant given out to, by several foundations to support the growth of the open notes phenomenon. I suspect in five to 10 years, this will just be common that everybody will do it. Patients will have full access to everything. In addition, we've already talked a little bit about the, uh, this issue of using uh, behavioral health prompts and getting patients to take advantage of electronic connection uh, to change behavior. And I think that's going to happen. Patients will increasingly have the information they need to make informed choices. Increasing amounts of care will be self-care aided by IT decision support. And we've heard about this already using data from surveys, lab sensors, genes, social media. The system will suggest appropriate behavior and nudge us toward it. And you've already heard some examples about changes in diet, for example, for inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, how far is this going to go? You know about the Internet of Things, where everything in your life is going to have a chip in it. So for the patient with heart failure, well, if the scale says you gained a couple of pounds, you're going to get a prompt saying, you know, be careful with your salt. Uh, but eventually, it may very well lock your salt shaker. Now, do you want that? You could lock your refrigerator if you're taking in too many calories. There's something about this that's a little bit creepy, uh, but you can envision a world where not only is it giving us behavioral prompts, but it's actually intervening in ways uh, that are even uh, are hard to imagine. So. so let's talk about how good is this or how problematic is this. This is a uh, book by uh, Eric Topol, you may have seen, uh, Eric from San Diego, uh, uh, talks about how wonderful it is that the patient is in charge. He writes, the patient becomes the chief operating officer, a notable promotion from nobody to senior management. The COO monitors all the operations of the body. Uh, he is fully in charge, including of the team and IT, getting all the relevant data accurately and rapidly analyzed and reporting back to him. The COO has periodic and ad hoc reporting to the CEO, the doctor. Uh, an inspiring vision in some way, a little bit scary if you're in the profession of medicine and feel like this is sort of how is this relationship going to work. So let me tell you a little bit why I worry about this, and maybe I'm worrying too much, but I do worry about this, at least in the short term. Uh, one is that, oh, you know, part of the thing that's going to happen to enable all this is we'll just alert the doctor or alert the patient if something is going off the rails. Talk a little about the dark side of open notes, and the question of can patients really be their own doctors, and do they want to be? And then I'm end with a minute uh, or two talking about the tension, I think the inevitable tension between IT and the humanity of medicine. So if you think about once you have a digitally enabled system, one of the key uh, uh, attributes of it is, oh, I can, I can send a message to the patient if something's going wrong. Or I can send a message to the doctor or the nurse if something's going wrong or might be going wrong. That's sort of a fundamental tool within IT to create action, to, to make things actionable. That sounds good, except uh, it can be problematic. Uh, here is one piece of technology we've had around for a long time. This is the ICU monitor. And if you've been in ICU, you know that it's monitoring the patient's heart rate, respiratory rate, O2 sat EKG check traits. Uh, Barbara Drew at our nursing school did a study last year. She looked at one month in our intensive care units at UCSF. We have 70 ICU beds. And they asked the question, how many alerts or alarms are fired in a month? across our 70 ICU beds. Anybody who doesn't know the answer, can anybody take a guess? Any, any guesses? A million. Oh my god, a million. A million, what's that? Uh, for a month, 70 ICU beds, a million. No, I can't do that. All right. Well, the answer is 2.5 million. <laughs> 
Uh, that's uh, unbelievable. If you think about that, that is an audible alert every seven minutes going off. And uh, Barbara told me a story. She was talking to a nurse by the bedside, and the alarms were going off every couple seconds. Barbara kept jumping. The nurse seemed completely calm. Barbara said to the nurse, at the bedside of a very sick ICU patient, what would get you worried if your patient was really, really sick? And the nurse thought for a second, and then she said, silence. <laughs> if there were no alarms, I'd be really nervous if something terrible was just happening. Remember, this began with perfectly well-meaning people and engineers saying, what a great thing, we can monitor stuff and alert the people if something is going wrong or might be going wrong. And it's gotten to the point, of course, where you pay no attention to any of the alerts or alarms because no human could possibly uh, pay attention to 2.5 million alarms. In researching my book, I spent some time at Boeing headquarters, and they were unbelievably different and thoughtful about alarms, saying to me, you know, when we engineer the cockpit, we know that every unnecessary alarm is dangerous, and we do everything we can not to trigger an alarm. We're capturing the data, we're sending it to someone who's looking at the system and, and, and tweaking the system, but we are incredibly careful not to over-alarm the pilots because they're busy, and when an alarm goes off, we want them to pay, pay uh, tremendous attention. Uh, they also, uh, they have a principle of user-centered design where they engineer, they'll put in a bunch of alarms because they think it might be a good idea, but then they spend thousands of hours watching the pilots fly simulators and real planes and then they, they're always surprised. Like, oh, wow, I thought that alarm was a good idea, but it's a bad idea. The kind of work we've not really yet done in healthcare, I see. Uh, let me shift a little bit to this idea of patients having access to their own record. Sounds like a good idea. Uh, I'm hoping some of you are Seinfeld fans. Uh, to me, Seinfeld is like all truth in life lives in Seinfeld. So here's Elaine <laughs> going to see her doctor in the days when we were on paper. Um, and uh, here's what happened. The doctor will be with you in a moment. Difficult. Eli, you me? Shh, you're reading that. Tell me about this uh, rash of yours. Um, well, it's, it's, you know, I noticed that someone wrote in my chart that I was difficult in January of 92. And I have to tell you, I remember that appointment exactly. You see, this nurse had asked me to put a gown on, but it was a mole on my shoulder. And actually, I had specifically worn a tank top so that I wouldn't have to put a gown on. You know, I made a paper. <laughs> well, this is a long time ago. How about if I just uh, erase it? <laughs> well, not that rash. But it was in N. <laughs> in fake race. <laughs> All right, Miss Vince. This doesn't look too serious. You should be fine. What are you writing? Doctor? All right, so. <laughs> This fear in the open notes world that we're going to spend all of our life erasing or fake erasing and patients are going to be sensitive to seeing what we said about them. I don't think we've worked through all the details, although as I said, it's gone better than we thought. Here's another problem I think that may arise with uh, open notes that we've just got to be attentive to. It's something I wrote in the book. Moreover, as you've seen, medical diagnosis is largely a game of probabilities. Whether I pin the diagnosis of pneumonia or heart failure to a set of findings is entirely probabilistic. I do so when the information I have crosses my threshold for, quote, ruling in the diagnosis. Such thresholds vary depending on the stakes. I'll solve some pneumonia if I'm 90% sure that it's pneumonia and rethink it if the patient doesn't get better with antibiotics, whereas I reserve the label cancer until I'm essentially 100% sure. Will my patients understand this? On top of that, many of my notes include a differential diagnosis, the list of possibilities that doctors learn to agree in every case. But how will a patient handle probable viral infection that means rule out HIV, rheumatologic disorder, and malignancy? That's good medicine, yet I might not write it if I knew that the audience included the patient himself. Real tension, I don't have the right answer to it, but we have to think this through. It's a different thought process than we've ever had before. It can easily lead to a dumbing down of the notes in ways that may actually be harmful. Uh, let me give you one other challenge of patients becoming their own diagnostician. This is my other son, uh, Benjamin. 
uh, not the one who's here. Uh, Benji actually narrated the audiobook of, of, of my book. It did a great job. That's him uh, doing it. He called me several months ago and uh, in a panic. And he said, Dad, I have diabetes and glaucoma. And I said, Sweet, what the hell are you talking about? And he said, I looked up my symptoms on WebMD. And uh, in fact, the symptoms superficially sounded like diabetes and glaucoma. He had neither one of those. So as patients go online to look up information, they will overdiagnose themselves uh, and or sometimes underdiagnose themselves and make terrible mistakes. Um, so we just have to think this through. And it's not like it's wrong. It's not like the benefits of that uh, will not outweigh the downsides. I think benefits probably will over time. But if we just introduce these technologies and don't think about unanticipated consequences, we will get it wrong. Let me end with a couple of last points and ones that I worry about, I'd say most deeply, as we think about patient-facing technology. Uh, this is Franz Engelfinger. Franz Engelfinger was the editor of the New England Journal uh, in the, from the mid-60s to the mid-70s. Uh, Engelfinger was a gastroenterologist and uh, one of the most esteemed figures in medicine uh, as editor of the major journal in the field, of course. And as uh, tragic irony would have it, he developed a, a cancer of the distal esophagus. And Engelfinger was probably the world's expert on cancers of the distal esophagus. Engelfinger went uh, from doctor to doctor in Boston to try to figure out what to do about this cancer. And each doctor he saw said, Franz, what would you do? And he found himself tied up in a pretzel. He was getting more and more anxious about this. And finally, uh, he went to another physician, a wise physician, uh, who, uh, uh, who figured out what Dr. Engelfinger really needed. And this is what he wrote in an article soon before he died of this cancer in 1980. He wrote, I have subscribed for some time to the principle that the physician must be authoritarian and paternalistic to some degree, and my experience as a patient has substantiated that belief. I receive from physician friends throughout the country a barrage of well-intentioned and contradictory advice. As a result, not only I, but my wife, my son, and my daughter-in-law, both doctors, became increasingly confused and emotionally distraught. Finally, when the pangs of indecision had become nearly intolerable, one wise physician friend said, what you really need is a doctor. When that excellent advice was followed, my family and I sensed immediate and immense relief. This is not like getting financial advice online or making a reservation on open table. Uh, this is profound and deep and a source of tremendous anxiety, and there will be a role for doctors even in a world where patients uh, can get a lot of information themselves. So what's the right balance? I think patients, especially those with chronic diseases, need tools for self-monitoring and engagement. Layers that we have not yet developed, although it sounds like you're working on them. Layers of smart algorithms, coaches, uh, what sometimes are called care traffic controllers who are monitoring a group of patients out there, all of this data coming in, trying to figure out what's going on, and physicians and other clinicians should help patients get the best care at the lowest cost, but we have to figure out how to, uh, oh, sorry, we have to figure out how to avoid overload and do this with seamless integration, and it does not yet exist. <coughs> patients have to have access to physicians and the medical care system when they need them without making unrealistic assumptions about what they can and what they should do for themselves. That's the balance that I think we have to try to get right, and I think we're at the, at the baby steps of trying to achieve that balance. I'm going to end with uh, reading for you uh, the last two pages of the book. It takes about two or three minutes, but it was my effort to bring all of this back to this tension between computerization and the humanity of medicine. It's, to me, it's, that's the crux of the issue. We can figure out all of this, and figure out the algorithms. At some point, we have to balance the idea of digitizing patients, focusing on the digital data versus the humanity of medicine. And that's a tricky balance, but that's the way I chose to end the book. So let me read you uh, this, this story. A couple of years ago, I was caring for a patient in his 70s, what's called a Mr. Gordon, in the ICU at UCSF. This was a challenging case. While it was clinically obvious that the patient who had widely metastatic cancer was going to die, several members of the family had not come to terms with this sad reality. Layered on top of that, I sensed significant conflict within the family. The patient's son and daughter were cool toward each other, nearly businesslike, and the son and the daughter's husband could hardly stand to be in the same room. 
As Mr. Gordon drifted in and out of consciousness, I sat down with the family in a conference room just outside the unit. The family tension suffused the room with a heavy air, a smog of long-standing resentments. I described the clinical situation. I told them how it was that we were sure that Mr. Gordon was dying. I gave them my assessment that ongoing aggressive care would be futile and inhumane. I recounted my consultations with the ICU specialist, the oncologist, and the palliative care team, all of whom endorsed my prognosis and approach. I told them that I understood their desire to keep Mr. Gordon alive, but that I believed the time had come to stop trying. After talking for a while, family members began to describe some happy memories of their time with Mr. Gordon and recalled his attitudes about an end-of-life care. It became clear he would not have wanted aggressive care at this stage. I could feel the family members gradually casting aside their grievances, if only temporarily, as they coalesced around his interests. Their questions answered, I left the room and returned to the ICU. A few moments later, Mr. Gordon's son, holding back tears, found me in the ICU and told me that the family had decided that it was time to allow his dad to die peacefully. I replied that I understood how wrenching this decision was, but that it was the right one, one that I would make for one of my own parents. He went back to the waiting room to rejoin his family. I entered Mr. Gordon's room and informed the nurse that we would be switching from our current cold court press to comfort care. I asked him to turn down the oxygen on the ventilator, to remove all the IVs except the one for morphine, and to bring some chairs into the room to allow the family to be at Mr. Gordon's bedside during his final minutes. I walked out to the waiting room to inform the family that the time had come and then escorted them in to see Mr. Gordon for the very last time. They entered the room one by one. The two siblings embraced. The son and son-in-law nodded at each other, an act I interpreted as a momentary truce. And all four took seats surrounding the patient's bed. Mr. Gordon lay still now unconscious from his morphine drip. The stage was set, but then I noticed a problem. In his haste to discontinue the various tubes and treatments, the nurse had forgotten to disconnect the bedside cardiac monitor, which continued to flicker a few feet above Mr. Gordon's head. And so it was that at one of life's most profound moments, a moment nearly impossible in its mystery and poignancy, a moment paradoxically rich with promise and ineffable sadness. All four family members' eyes were raised, not searching for truth or for God, but watching little squiggles, each electronic signature of a heartbeat, march across the rectangular screen. Mr. Gordon's son was sitting close to the monitor. I put my hand on his shoulder, speaking to all of them, I said, your dad is comfortable and I'm so glad you could all be here with him. I'm sure he is too. But, and I pointed to the heart monitor, there is absolutely nothing on this screen that matters. And I pressed the off button. As the screen went to black, the family members shared a look of shock, then clarity, and then, what was it? Acceptance, warmth, gratitude, transcendence, maybe even love. After a moment of gathering themselves, each turned to Mr. Gordon squeezed his hands, stroked his arm, touched his cheek. The scene was pure, peaceful, and in a way that is hard to describe, quite beautiful. And then he died. Thank you so much for your attention.